following is an EWTN special presentation. Well, uh, for our next speaker, we have a very well-qualified one uh, who is going to be speaking to you about the Shroud of Turin, <laughs> namely myself. So uh, uh, you've known my... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, I think I'm just going to begin uh, straight away. Uh, the Shroud of Turin, uh, as you can uh, see, um, is um, a 14-foot linen cloth. And on that 14-foot linen cloth is etched uh, the figure of a man. And uh, there are blood stains throughout. And um, it is the most uh, scientifically examined historical relic, I mean, secular and sacred uh, historical relic that we have. So for all intents and purposes, no other historical uh, document has been examined by more scientists in more ways than the Shroud of Turin. Uh, furthermore, this image is completely unique. There is no other image like it in the history of images. Um, and you'll see, well, for, in a moment, you'll, you'll think, well, what's so special about this? What's so special about it, we'll talk about five enigmas, uh, is that you have essentially a perfect three-dimensional photographic negative image on a non-photographically sensitive linen cloth. This is a most remarkable thing, as you'll see in a moment, because it not only gives us a very good sense of Jesus' crucifixion and the historical validation of it, but a very good sense of his resurrection and even a historical validation of that. There is really a supernatural remnant of that resurrection embedded on this cloth. But we have to get around some stuff first, namely uh, the 1988 carbon dating. But before I do, I just want you to take a look at some of these pictures. Uh, the picture you see here is the face of Jesus, uh, I believe. Um, I think there's a 98% chance that this is the face of Jesus. Um, and uh, about a 2% chance that something could go absolutely radically wrong and show that the uh, 27 scientists who have investigated this, uh, and of course the 250 different scientists who have tangentially investigating it, were somehow badly mistaken. But I don't think so. The thing is, is if you look at that face, and I would say, write to Barry Schwartz, and uh, you know, he has a big website there, and get yourself a photograph of that, and use it for your prayer, because I think that's the actual face of Jesus, which changed the entire iconography uh, of Europe uh, uh, after uh, 360 AD. Now, I'm just going to, the second image that you see, and um, uh, this one is the full length of the cloth. You can see, again, the photographic negative. Uh, this is not the actual shroud itself. This is the photographic negative of, of the shroud. And you can see the whole body. You can see the blood wounds there because they're positive image, right? And um, uh, in the background, the negative, I mean, they're now a negative image. And the positive image in this photographic negative is the actual man. And you can see, of course, some stains along the side of it, uh, which are, uh, came from the fire of Chambray, and that uh, were patched up by some sisters in the 1500s. If you look at this next one, you'll see an actual photograph of the uh, shroud itself. And uh, there you you'll see, well, that's just like a straw-like image. Uh, how in the world did it give rise to this photographic negative? Yes. How in the world did it give rise to this photographic negative? More on that in a moment. But let's go to, I think, the thing which is disturbing everyone. Because in 1978, as I said, uh, a host of scientists uh, came uh, to Turin, Italy. They examined this shroud for nearly a week. Uh, they performed a myriad of scientific tests on the shroud. 
and were convinced that the Shroud of Turin was authentic from a variety of different points of view, from thermochemical points of view, physical points of view, medical points of view, photographic points of view, etc. And of course, after all of this, 10 years later, in 1988, we had a carbon dating, and the carbon dating suggested that the shroud came from the 15th century. Everybody was devastated. They thought, oh my gosh, how could we have been so badly mistaken? Yet, the two uh, people who went over there seemed to be uh, you know, <clears throat> good people who took the sample. It went, of course, to three labs uh, whose reputations are just uh, unstained uh, academically. And uh, there it was, the, the, the shroud is placed uh, there at the 15th century. And so people were, were just uh, 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 devastated. However, um, starting in 2000, uh, the problem of that 1988 carbon dating began to unravel. The story begins, however, back at the Stirp investigation in 1978, where protocols were set out for the carbon dating of the shroud. That seven samples were to be taken from the shroud, and these seven samples were to be from different places on the shroud. The, each <coughs> sample <clears throat> before it was taken, was supposed to be <clears throat> analyzed by a materials analyst and also by a thermochemical analyst to make sure that it uh, that, that comes from the original linen. And then these seven samples were to be sent to seven different labs. That's not what happened. What happened in 1988 is that two uh, people took a single strand from a highly controversial patch in the corner of the shroud and took that single strand, divided it into three places and sent it to three different labs. Every single protocol was violated. The materials expert and the thermochemical expert were there, but they did not look at the shroud. So strange things happened. The lab came up with this result. But in 2000, uh, Sue Benford and um, uh, a fellow named uh, Marino uh, uh, Benedictine came together and uh, they pointed out uh, that they had some sticky tapes some, uh, from the uh, <clears throat> Reyes samples uh, that had been taken. And uh, they analyzed those sticky tapes because they were very, very close to the patch from which the shroud sample was removed. And there they published a finding that, uh, that the, there was cotton in the fibrils of the sticky tapes from those samples. And they concluded, because of course this is a linen fabric, right? It's a very fine linen, a triple thick, very fine linen with a very easily identifiable twill and tweed. The, the, for all intents and purposes, there was no cotton in it. In fact, there was no cotton in Israel uh, in, in the first century. But of course, they identified it as having cotton, and they threw doubt on the sample that was actually taken from the shroud. Now, Dr. Ray Rogers, who was one of the head thermochemists in the 1978 STIRP, uh, STIRP by the way, means Shroud of Turin Research Project, STIRP investigation, he uh, called up Barry Schwartz and he said, take that article from Benford and, and uh, uh, Marino off of your, uh, your website there. I mean, they're, they're, it's absolutely unthinkable that this, uh, you know, a sample w would have been, you know, uh, uh, almost, you know, purposely taken from a bad part of the shroud. And Barry Schwartz just said back to uh, Ray Rogers, well, Ray, what, what, why don't you uh, tell them that? Or, Ray, why don't you disprove it? So he said, okay, I will. And so he gets over there, and he had a bunch of sticky tapes that were very, very, very close uh, to the uh, patch from which the shroud uh, a sample was removed. And he then subjected it to four different scientific uh, tests. And after those four tests, it became very clear that there was not only cotton 
embedded in the sample that was taken. Of course, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the origin of that cotton in a moment. But there was also, <clears throat> that cotton was dyed. And it was dyed <clears throat> with a gum dye mordant that adhered the dye to the cotton, right, <clears throat> that was only available in Europe in the 15th century. So, of course, alarm bells are going off because there, there is no cotton throughout the rest of the linen. And Ray, Roger of, Ray Rogers and uh, Dr. Rogers came to the uh, epiphany right away that, of course, this could not have been from the original linen on the shroud. And, of course, he completely, with his uh, you know, uh, uh, unbelievable reputation, he discredited the sample. And Joan Jacoby is just going to uh, read for you his uh, final analysis. The combined evidence from chemical kinetics analytical chemistry, cotton content, and pyrolysis mass spectrometry proves that the material from the radiocarbon area of the shroud is significantly different from that of the main cloth. The radiocarbon sample was thus not part of the original cloth and is invalid for determining the age of the shroud. Kaboom. So if you... <laughs> Uh, and by the way, this has been validated again and again and again and again by many different fibrils from many different sticky tapes, very close to the patch or on the patch itself. There's no question about it. This was an invalid sample. Don't ask me why it was utilized. Don't ask me why fluorescent tests had not been done. Don't ask me why materialist analysts uh, didn't examine it. Don't ask me why only one single fabric was taken from this highly controversial patch, which, uh, <clears throat> you know, after, uh, we'll talk about that patch in a second. Don't ask me why they selected this to send to the labs. But in my uh, opinion, there's something very, very strange going on here. Uh, something very strange. Now, where did the patch come from and how did that cotton get onto that linen shroud? The, the shroud was in uh, what was called the fire of Chambray, and in that fire, um, or after that fire, some sisters in the 1400s sewed together all the damaged parts uh, uh, on the Shroud of Turin. And you can see those little, uh, you, know, uh, um, you know, patches that go down the side of the Shroud on either side of the body, right? And in this lower corner there, you can see again another uh, patch there. And they sewed together these things by weaving uh, dyed cotton in, in between the various fabric, uh, uh, fibers. And, and of course, uh, that precisely, that, uh, a patch and a, and a, and a specific uh, fiber from that patch was taken for uh, dating purposes, which is completely invalid. That, of course, came from uh, the 15th century. Since the time of the shroud, four additional dating tests have been done. I was just in my office last Monday before the, uh, we came up here for um, uh, the Napa Institute with uh, Dr. Julio Fonti, uh, myself, for uh, about two and a half hours uh, talking about these things, but I'm just going to go rapidly through them with you. Since the 1988 carbon dating, starting actually in 2005, uh, Dr. Ray Rogers <clears throat> and Dr. Um, Julio Fonti did four additional uh, kinds of, of, of dating tests. Let's call this intrinsic dating methods, and we're going to talk about three extrinsic dating methods in just a moment. The intrinsic dating methods, the first one was done by Ray Rogers himself. <clears throat> it was called a vanillin test. Vanillin is um, basically a trace element that decays over the course of time uh, in fabrics like linen. And you can date pretty closely the decay of, of uh, vanillin uh, in a fabric like a linen over the course of time. And uh, uh, Ray Rogers uh, clearly even accounting for carbon absorption that would have happened during the fire of Chambray, <clears throat> Dr. Rogers, um, showed that the vanillin content uh, was uh, sufficiently low uh, to suggest uh, that uh, the shroud had to have been produced before the fourth century, before the, the 300s. And, and that would seem to be the case anyway because of what we'll call the, later the Mandelian evidence. But uh, so we've got somebody who's already saying uh, th there's no way this came from the 15th century. The, the vanillin content is way, 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 way too low. 
uh, to, to explain uh, how it could have come from the 15th century. So already we have serious doubt. Dr. Giulio Fonti then did a, a secondary test uh, and he started these tests, I believe, in about 2007, 2008, and then uh, completed the first set of tests in uh, 2010 and published them in a book called Il Mistero di Sindone, The, the Mystery of the Shroud of Turin. <clears throat> and in this, uh, the first test is called a, a Fourier Transformed Infrared Spectroscopy Test. Um, <clears throat> again, we're looking for trace elements that decay over the course of time. You put together metrics and so forth of other cloths, 3,000-year-old Egyptian linens, etc., all the way up to 50-year-old linens, and you kind of look at where these trace elements come from that can be scattered, you know, the m molecules uh, scattered and, and then measured in, in spectroscopic analysis. And uh, I'm going to just give you the, the overall result. The second uh, test he performed was a Raman uh, laser um, uh, uh, spectroscopy, uh, which is a different kind of test. <clears throat> it's less vulnerable to the carbon absorption that would have occurred in the fire of Chambray. So we see um, um, that, uh, that the fire actually um, wouldn't have affected the Raman laser uh, spectroscopy nearly as much. Again, using uh, this test for different trace elements that decay over the course of time. Finally, he's done several different uh, iterations of a mechanical um, compressibility and tension test. Basically, it's a breaking point test on uh, myriads of fibers, uh, you know, in different uh, directions, uh, and uh, uh, testing it for uh, its crushability uh, before it breaks versus its, you know, tension, its stretchability before it breaks, and so these mechanical, uh, uh, you know, uh, tests. If you average together uh, all of those results, uh, basically what you get is a date of 50 AD, very much close to the time of Jesus' crucifixion, plus or minus 200 years with 96% confidence level. This is not the 15th century. This is very, very close intrinsic data to getting right to the time of Jesus. But I'm going to spend a little more time on the date because it is controversial and you need to know the full range of data that we have for the date. So there's <clears throat> three extrinsic uh, data sources for the date as well. <clears throat> the first one uh, are, um, is really place and date. And these are the pollen grains or the, the fossils of pollen grains that were gathered uh, by Dr. Max Fry. Uh, Max Fry, at, uh, he's a, in Switzerland, uh, and he is probably the foremost uh, analyst of, of pollen grains and pollen fossils uh, by far in the world, and certainly had the largest international uh, collection in his own laboratory. Uh, <clears throat> what Fry found is that the preponderance of these po pollen uh, fossils are from the area of Jerusalem and northern Judea, with five of those pollen grains indigenous to Judea, uh, northern Judea, and Jerusalem. That's important. How did you get indigenous pollen grains in the 15th century? How in the world did you get those, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring them all the way to Europe and Leary, France, and you get the point. Uh, number two, the second most uh, uh, evident uh, pollen grains come from Edessa, Turkey. And uh, we, there's, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. And the third greatest uh, number come from Constantinople, Turkey. And finally, the, the least number, but still a significant number, come from southern France, uh, where, of course, uh, you know, the, uh, the shroud was discovered uh, in the hands of Geoffrey de Charnay, right in, uh, um, uh, in uh, the, the 1300s. Now, what's the point uh, uh, you know, at hand here? Uh, what Fry discovers uh, is that this, this cloth must have been exposed in the Jerusalem and northern Judea area for quite some time. But then, it, we know it goes uh, uh, to Edessa, Turkey, because that's the next greatest number of possible grain, uh, um, uh, fall, uh, 
<laughs> pollen fossils and crates. And of course, we know that um, there was a thing called the Mandelian in Edessa, Turkey. And the Mandelian was the so-called face of Jesus. And it was basically a, a face that was put into a frame. We now think that it was the Shroud of Turin that was folded and put into a frame so that the face of Jesus is there. We still have the folding marks from it being in that frame for about 500 years, compressed in that frame. And so there's very little um, you know, exposure uh, to the outside except for the face where, of course, you get the next set of pollen grains from Edessa. How do we know that that was the Mandelian? Because once this shroud shows up in Edessa, Turkey, the complete iconography of Jesus in the Western church changes. We start off with Jesus having a Roman face, Roman hair, no beard, Roman nose, right? And all of a sudden, <clears throat> this thing shows up, you know, at least according to the Pauline evidence, it shows up, and what do we have? We suddenly have the iconography changing to a Semitic man with long hair, with a beard, who's darkly complected and has a Semitic, has Semitic nose and features. Why? Not only that, but Paul Vignon identified that there are 24 different marks <coughs> from the face <clears throat> on the Shroud of Turin that shows up in the Edessa iconography. And these marks either come from the crucifixion or from something that actually happened to the Shroud in transport. How would these iconographers know it? My, my point is, it goes from Edessa then to uh, Constantinople. It's seen by several of the crusaders. It's unfurled, and it's seen to be the burial cloth of Christ. Suddenly, uh, we see in the Third Crusade, it disappears, and then it winds up in the hands of Geoffrey de Charnay, a fifth-generation relative of uh, one of the leaders uh, of that crusade. Uh, who just happens to get it, or whose wife, I should say, is a fifth generation relative of uh, one of the leaders of the crusade, who happens to get it, and then, of course, uh, the, the rest of the provenance of the shroud is very, very clear since that time. So that's one thing. The pollen evidence corresponds to the iconographic evidence. It seems pretty, uh, we've got a pretty good idea of the journey it took. The second area is really also quite fascinating, uh, and that is that there are two coins, Roman leptons, <clears throat> that are on the eyes of the man in the shroud, and they were used to keep the, the eyelids closed. And so if you, if you look uh, uh, closely at, at the shroud itself uh, with uh, digital photography, you can see these coins there, and they turn out to be Roman leptons. Now, for a while, it was doubted, right? They, people just said, you know, oh, this, this, this can't be, you know, the, the, the case because, after all, right, um, the, 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 uh, there's, there's two mistakes on those coins, two enigmas on those coins that are not present on other Roman leptons. But then they made a remarkable discovery. I, a Jesuit was actually in, in, in involved in this discovery uh, that it was a special minting these coins were a special minting of Roman leptons done by none other than Pontius Pilate in Jerusalem in 29 AD. That's what those enigmas represent, and it is a positive identification. Joan's just going to read for you really quickly uh, Alan Wonger, who actually did the digital overlay photography that, that proved this. Uh, he's just read his uh, conclusion. We have done this by means of the polarized image overlay technique that we developed, which enables the highly accurate comparison of two different images and the documentation of the various points of congruence. Using the forensic criteria for matching fingerprints, we feel that there is overwhelming evidence for the identification of the images and the matches with the coins those coins minted by Pontius Pilate in 29 AD. Would somebody mind telling me how a medieval forger in the 15th century 
got these two coins. We have only about five of them in all the collections right now in the world numismatic uh, uh, coin collections uh, throughout the world. Uh, not happening. Last piece of evidence. Um, and that is the, uh, what's called the face cloth of Oviedo. The face cloth of, of Oviedo, uh, we have a provenance for that that goes back to the 600s. And we know precisely where it went. We know that it goes to southern Spain. We know that it gets to Isidore of Seville. We know that he places it in the cathedral there at Oviedo. And there it stays essentially from the 600s to this day. Now, what else do we know? <clears throat> we know that this cloth had to touch the same face as the, the Shroud of Turin. The same face had to make the imprints. How do we know that? There are 124 bloodstains on the face cloth of Oviedo, and they match perfectly the 124 bloodstains on the face of the man in the shroud. Now, what is the face cloth of Oviedo? You may go back to the Gospel of John there, and you read that John, right, and Peter arrive at the tomb. The younger disciple John looks in, and he sees a face cloth rolled up in a place by itself. And then he looks and he, he sees, he believes. Now what's the, this face cloth, what was it used for? It was used essentially by the Jewish people to carry the body from the cross over to uh, uh, the, the tomb because of course uh, you know, there would be fluids coming out of the man's mouth and, and, and out of his nose and the, the macabre face from all of the beatings uh, you know, it's just uh, not to be shown uh, in public. So they took a cloth and they wrapped it all the way around him. And that means that it went actually down to the nape of his neck. And so it, it, it literally takes all of the blood that's on the man's face, back of the head, nape of the neck, on the sides of his cheeks, etc. All of that it comes out. And of course, that can be matched very precisely with the same digital overlay techniques that Alan Vonger used with respect uh, to uh, the coins on the man's eyes. It's an identical match. Do you know the odds that you could get an identical blood stain match from 124 unique different wounds without that cloth touching, those two cloths touching the same face? If the cloth of Oviedo has a provenance going back to the 6th century, and very likely before, all the way to 50 AD, you can probably be sure that the Shroud of Turin did as well, because it touched the same face. What are the odds that this goes back to 50 AD, plus or minus 200 years? What are the odds that this goes back to the time of Jesus, to the place of Jesus, Jerusalem and northern Judea, exceedingly, exceedingly good. And if you're going to disprove it, you're going to have to, a lot of explaining to do, you're going to have to figure out how in the world to create all of these so-called illusions. No way. I think the odds are exceedingly good. You're going to get the next carbon dating, which everyone is pleading for, which will now abide by the STIRP protocols that were established, it's going to show without a doubt that the shroud comes from this period. And of course, with the pollen fossils, we know where it came from. Let's go to the next uh, area, which is the blood evidence. Uh, this is really fascinating stuff, and it's becoming fascinating by the day. Brand new discovery was made two and a half weeks ago as well. But let me just go through it with you very, very quickly. Uh, number one. These are not blood, uh, these are not um, uh, dyes, these are not paints, anything of that nature. This is genuine blood that's, uh, you know, manifest throughout the entire shroud. We know the following facts about it. Number one, it is filled with hemoglobin. Number two, the blood type is AB positive. Number three, it has a genetic profile. 
only partial genetic profile, and the reason for that is that you know, it's been contaminated again and again by touching over the years. So people have been touching this blood, right, you know, trying to, as it were, get a, uh, you know, the, the, the sense of the Lord's blood. Uh, and, and because they touched it, they contaminated uh, the DNA sample. So we'll never get a pure uh, DNA sample from it. But there's other unusual characteristics uh, about the blood. Uh, first of all, uh, the unique crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, the Gospels describe a very, very unique crucifixion, not one common to Roman criminals. First of all, uh, you know, Jesus was wearing a crown of thorns. Well, that, that works for Jesus, who they claim, uh, claimed he was king of the Jews. But other criminals were not you know, crucified with a crown of thorns. Clearly, this man was. We know the exact kind of crown that he would, right? There, there was uh, thorns on top of his head, not just on the side of his head, as we see in artists' renditions, right? These, this crown went right on top, and it was penetrating everything. And when his head went back, right, you know, during the crucifixion, <clears throat> those thorns were penetrating into the nape of his neck. We know this. Number two, that's unique. Number two, there is a big gash between the fifth and sixth ribs uh, there uh, from a, uh, um, a, a hole in his side that we presume came from a Roman pilum, uh, which was a, a, a spear carried by Roman legionaries. Why? Because, of course, this Roman pilum right, um, is described in, 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 uh, in John's Gospel, right? The spear was thrown into the side of the man and out flowed blood and water. And of course, if you, go, if you thrust a specific spear, and by the way, you, know, you can use the same digital overlay photography with the, the spear head and put it over the wound in the man. You can see very clearly how it goes right up. And when it's thrust up at that angle uh, into the man's heart, it actually goes right through the pericardial sac and then into the heart, which releases a transparent fluid from the sac before the blood comes and out is released transparent fluid looking like water and blood. And of course, uh, again, uh, is, does this match with the evidence? Yes, it does. Is it unique to Jesus' crucifixion? Yes, it is, because you know, the Romans didn't put people out of their misery fast. Remember, Jesus, when they came to Jesus, he was dead. So this was just kind of like, well, let's make sure, thrust the old spear there and make sure he's dead, but he looks dead. So the idea then is, right, this is a verification thing. Third thing that you notice is that uh, Jesus is nailed to the cross. This is not typical at all for Roman crucifixions. Uh, they tied the man to the cross so that he could suffocate over the course of you know, a, a good eight to 12 hours. Jesus, however, seemingly to increase his pain over the short duration, they put in these nails, and the nails, by the way, are exactly in the place where they would need to be for the hands. Right? You could never put a nail through the hand, right? Too much fleshy tissue, just rip right out. What the nails do is they go straight up through the wrist and go right through that whole big knot of nerve fibers that go right into the hand and into the fingers. So the man is just beset by pain as that nail goes right through uh, the wrist in, uh, to the upper, uh, into the middle part of the hand and then onto the cross. Now that's Jesus' crucifixion, very unique. The same thing with the, the nails that go into his uh, uh, ankles through his feet. They didn't go into his feet per se. So they're, they're uh, and uh, again, a whole set of nerves are just hit. So every time Jesus, uh, the, the man is raising himself up to breathe, right? The pain from all these nerves, right? He's going to have to, you know, uh, 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 literally overcome the pain to raise himself up, you, you know, uh, in, in to breathe uh, is, is going to be excruciating beyond belief. We know also that the man was whipped by a, a very commonly used Roman legionnaire's whip. It has three strands. It has bone chips and metal, uh, you know, in the tips of the of the three strands. This man was whipped, uh, you know, a multiple number of times by that uh, kind of a Roman whip, 
So we know that, uh, that uh, this is very, very typical of Jesus' crucifixion, atypical of other kinds of crucifixions. And so it looks more and more like this is not just any person, right? This is clearly uh, Jesus in his unique crucifixion, precisely as described by the Gospels. And of course, we'll see in a moment, it couldn't have been forged and then we've got two recent pieces of blood evidence that's very, very important in showing the authenticity of the image. Uh, number one, uh, as you know, when blood dries on the skin of people, right, or you might know, right, as the blood coagulates, the serum from the blood separates out and dries in a place uh, around, generally, the wound. But in this case, all of this, uh, the, uh, the wounds on this man are all vertically juxtaposed. In other words, as the blood is coagulating, the serum is separating from the coagulated blood downwards. Why would that be? Because he's vertically transfixed on the cross. <clears throat> the blood is coming out. It's drying on his skin. The serum is separating, but it's not separating around the wound as it would typically. It's separating downwards, which shows that the man was uh, on, the, on, uh, um, you know, on a vertical axis. He was not horizontal at all when the, when the, wounds origi uh, when the blood originally dried. The other thing, which is fascinating, uh, just came out in the news reports, I think you probably saw it about two and a half, three weeks ago, um, that uh, two teams of uh, physicians and scientists, uh, one of whom was Dr. Giulio Fonti, um, uh, just discovered uh, the presence of ferrins and, and, and other um, uh, enzymes uh, that are produced in the blood only under severe, severe stress. So the blood, the, the blood stains throughout have these ferrins and other enzymes which show that the man was under, uh, being tormented, he was being tortured, he was under severe stress. So everything about this blood is not only pointing, this is not an artist, this is real blood. And it's real blood of a tormented <clears throat> and tortured man with an AB positive blood type and of course, that blood is coagulating when the man is vertically uh, on a vertical axis. Okay, so um, this is fascinating. It's validating precisely the gospel accounts of the unique crucifixion of Jesus. But there's much, much more. The evidence of the resurrection. Thoroughgoingly interesting. Let's get right to it. First of all, this image is a high, as I said, there is no other image like this in the world. There is, first of all, no fo uh, perfect photographic negative image on a photographically non uh, non-sensitively uh, uh, photographically non-sensitive material like a linen in the world. There isn't one. The second thing that's very interesting about this image is it's on the uppermost. Um, uh, uh, the uh, uppermost surface of the fibrils. Fibrils are little teeny constituents <clears throat> of the fibers themselves. And this image is just on the uppermost surface of those fibrils. It never penetrates to the medulla of the fiber. It never goes to the middle of the fiber. It never goes even to the, and therefore it never goes to the middle of the cloth, and it certainly doesn't go to the other side of the cloth. Well, what does that mean? The image could have never been produced by a vapor. If you had a vapor, that vapor would go right into the middle of the fibers, go right through to the other side of the cloth. It was certainly not produced by any liquid, like a paint or a dye. Why would that be? It go right to the middle of the fiber. It go right to the back of the cloth. There's no evidence for that at all. The uppermost surface of the fibrils alone. So, number three, it could never have been produced by scorching, because if it was produced by scorching, not only would the scorching have gone to the other to the middle of the fibers, it would have gone through the cloth, and sufficient scorching would have really ruined the cloth. It would not have helped it. <clears throat> so what is the origin of this 
bizarre image. What's the origin? Well, uh, basically, we, we have 12 uh, good physicists to thank for a theory that's finally been validated uh, in 2010 uh, by Paolo Di Lassaro and his team. But of course, this goes back to John Jackson, many other good physicists uh, from our La Los uh, uh, Alamos uh, uh, laboratories there in New Mexico. And what uh, Jackson speculated is in order to do this, what you're really going to need is light energy without the accompanying heat energy. Well, what does that mean? In other words, if you're going to turn this photographically, this non-photographically sensitive linen, if you're going to turn that into a photographically, a perfectly photographically sensitive material, where the image is literally a photographic negative image on the uppermost surface of the fibrils, the <clears throat> only way you're going to be able to do this is by a method of rapid dehydration with extreme accuracy. Not only extreme accuracy for where the linen is touching the actual skin of the man, but is actually uh, away from, right, where, the, where the, the, the linen is not touching the man, but also is going to produce the image on the shroud. How are you going to do that? You have to do it with light radiation without the accompanying heat radiation. How much light radiation would it take? Several billion, with a B, several billion watts. Now, that's like taking, oh, about a million searchlights and focusing it all on one single spot or going about 100,000 miles from the sun and opening your eyes. <laughs> this is really, 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 really bright. I don't have any other way of saying it. Now, what's the problem of having several billion watts of light energy <clears throat> to make this non-photographically sensitive material become a perfect photographic negative? If you had the accompanying heat energy for that, it would literally vaporize the entire cloth in less than a microsecond. In fact, it would vaporize the entire cloth if it was only one millionth of a second of heat energy. Okay, that's a five minute warning. Okay, all right, well, I'm gonna just finish this. Uh, and so what do you need? You need that several billion watts of energy to exist for one forty billionth of a second burst. We have only one way of replicating this in nature. And that one way is with vacuum ultraviolet radiation. Now we have duplicated it in the laboratory. Paulo de Lasaro did it in 2010. And when he did it in 2010, he showed that for one forty billionth of a second, you could produce that intensity of light. But in order to produce the image on the shroud with that method, it would take 14,000 eczema ARF lasers, exceeding all the laser and vacuum radiation capacity that we have in the world's laboratories today. It would take more than that to produce this image. Here's what De La Saro, uh, wrote in his conclusion, and I'll wind it up. I know I'm going to go over time. The ultraviolet light necessary to form the image exceeds the maximum power released by all ultraviolet light sources available today. It would require pulses having durations shorter than one forty billionth of a second and intensities on the order of several billion watts. Well, there you have it. Now, <laughs> I just got two more enigmas and I'll just give it to you first. How does a dead body produce that kind of light energy for one forty billionth of a second from every single three-dimensional point inside and out of it. I got to tell you, there's no natural cause. We're dealing now in the realm of miracle, as John Jackson said, a supernatural causative agent. One last enigma, and you'll get the point. There is a three-dimensional configuration to this image. We not only see right, the outside of the man's uh, body, we see contusions 
right, <clears throat> that are subdermal. Things you could only see with an x-ray, <clears throat> but they're perfectly apparent, these contusions, all over his body, over his cheekbones. We can see the bones, and they're inside the hand that you would only see with an x-ray. You see it in configuration, right, to the, uh, to the, um, um, uh, to the flesh outside the hands. What's the only explanation you are going to get for this? The only one that we have, uh, this is postulated uh, by John Jacks, Dr. John Jackson, the mechanically transparent man hypothesis. Literally, the man has to become spiritual so that that cloth can penetrate several millimeters into the, the actual body of the man still emanating this for one forty billionth of a second to give the x-ray effect of three-dimensionality. And by the way, it's perfectly digitally confirmed three-dimensional proportionality. You're talking two things here. Several billion watts of light for one forty billionth of a second, and the man is becoming mechanically transparent. He's becoming spiritual. Sounds like the gospel narratives to me. And not only does it sound like the gospel narratives to me, it sounds like a supernatural causative agency to me. It sounds like, if I can put it blankly, a miracle. A miracle of light. A miracle of spirit that is taking place inside that tomb. And I'm telling you, this is a relic of the resurrection. I don't see how in the world we're ever going to produce this by any other means other than laboratory means or using vacuum ultraviolet radiation. I think this confirms our Gospels from the blood evidence. It confirms the account of the crucifixion. It confirms the account of the glorified resurrection in spirit, the glorified resurrection in light and glory. I think what we have here is not only the face of Jesus Christ, the body of Jesus Christ, but a relic of his resurrection that God has surreptitiously planted right into our scientific culture at the very moment when everybody wants to become a skeptic. It's almost like God rearing up and saying, gotcha. Thanks, everybody.